Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to As I Live and Grieve. Really excited today. I know you hear me say that all the time about our (laughs) guest, but truly, this is a guest that was just brought to us. I, I keep thinking about it, praying about it, asking about it. And here she is. Today we have with us Deborah Eden Tull, who has graciously asked that we call her Eden. That is how she is known to most of her friends, family, network. So Eden, welcome today. And I'm not going to give you background. I would ask that you give a little bit of your background to our listeners. Welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And I would share that I'm a teacher of engaged Dharma. I come from Zen Buddhism, spent many years as a Buddhist monastic at a silent Zen monastery. And for my entire life, the natural world has been my greatest teacher. So I teach what some people refer to as eco Dharma. And I also teach the work that reconnects, a field of work created by Buddhist scholar and eco-philosopher Joanna Macy for honoring and transforming our love and pain for our world into compassionate action. So I would share that I, as a very young person, became aware through the work of my parents who were social workers of the incredible inequity of the world, of the marginalization that was going on and still is today, even worse, of the environmental devastation. And I have an incredible mother who started a number of nonprofits throughout her life with the mission of addressing systemic homelessness. And I've learned so much through her, but really from a young age, I was heartbroken and also my heart opened (laughs) by the pain of what was going on in our world and also felt the calling through that to devote myself to service and find out, ask the questions that could lead me to how to be of service. When I was 11 years old, one day out of the blue, my father, who I was incredibly close to and who really was my first spiritual teacher, found out that he had one month left to live. And so my family was hit by the avalanche of impermanence. He had a kind of malignant melanoma cancer that had been misdiagnosed some years prior. And the experience of being hit by grief and then also seeing pretty quickly as a young person how unwelcome grief was in the social world I lived in, how few resources there seemed to be other than let's try to get through it as quickly as possible or turn away from it. This really, really inspired much of my path. So one of the fundamental teachings of Buddhism is the teaching of impermanence and letting ourselves open our hearts to the simple reality of impermanence as human beings and allowing this opening to impermanence inform how we live our lives. And for me, inform a sense from a very young age that there is not time to waste. And so what is of essence and what is most calling to my heart And how can I live from the place of greatest compassion, both for myself as a human being and for everyone I come into contact with? So practice is a full-time job, we say. (laughs) Practice involves both formal meditation and the daily rituals that we might participate in to really affirm living from presence, living awake and being aware of the habits of the conditioned mind to pull us into sleep, we might say. 
and equally informal practice of simply letting our whole life align with a commitment to presence inspired by impermanence. I would say presence and love <laughs> inspired by impermanence. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. And, and Eden, you have instantly pulled me in with your eloquence. You really have. To, to our listeners, I just purchased one of her books, Relational Mindfulness, and her, her words in her book do the exact same things. And one of the phrases in, in her book I was immediately drawn to was the fact that it's about awareness, but I got the impression that I have to want that awareness. I can't just sit in my, my rut of despair, so to speak, and expect all these things to happen. I have to make myself open to it. Would you say that's fair? Would you Is that a fair assumption? Yes, I would say that that's a fair assumption. And I would also suggest that it seems to me that every human being alive on planet Earth has a place deep core in their being that seeks awareness, that seeks joy, that seeks love, that seeks vibrant aliveness. There are so many roads, so many different pathways we take to get there. Uh, some people, we might say, come to this lifetime with many more obstacles and yes. delusions to struggle through before opening. but. I would say this is part of what helps us to remember who we actually are as human beings, that at the core of our being, this longing for love, because love is who we actually are, this longing for interconnection, for intimacy, because this is who we actually are. And we generally need to learn to live in right relationship with our ego, <laughs> the conditioned mind, right. what I call the mind of separation because it has other agendas, <laughs> very different than connection right. and love. Right, and right. So before we get to, oh, there's so many questions I have coming to my mind. And, <laughs> and, and of course, I can see Stephanie's face, and I know she's got questions in her mind too. But can I start out with, we're, we're talking about Buddhist principles and, and theories and everything specifically, and your education in that aspect of it. Can I ask initially, is Buddhism a religion? That's a great question. And the way I'll answer is to share that, yes, uh, historically, Buddhism is a religion. And as it's evolved, especially through contemporary times, it is also a spiritual path that people who don't necessarily find themselves aligned with religion or identified with the religion can practice and embody. Buddhism is not offering a set of rules or dogma to follow. It's offering a path of discovery and inquiry that each human being can only embody in the way that comes authentically and genuinely through them. So that's what I would offer. So there are people who consider themselves religious Buddhism, Buddhists, and there are many different lineages which have been beautifully protected and passed down throughout human history. And there are people who would say they live as Buddhists, but are in not any way religious. Yeah. Beautifully said. So toddler question <laughs> for, for Buddhists, is there like a Bible or Book of Common Prayer? First, I want to say that I love toddler question. That's an amazing <laughs> phrase. And um, there is not one common book because there are so many different lineages and traditions, but ancient texts by the Buddha himself are drawn upon from all of these traditions. And I want to say from the phrase toddler question that you asked, in Zen Buddhism, which is the tradition that I've found home in, there's a great emphasis on beginner's mind and bringing to each moment the mind of a beginner, the mind of a discoverer, letting go of the whole notion of the mind of the expert. I already know. I already know about all that. I don't have to bring uh, wonder <laughs> to it. And instead, hmm. emphasizing the, the childlike mind of wonder, which is really the quality of openness that showing up to our lives fully present invokes. So I love that phrase. 
<laughs> That's fascinating. Well, it's no secret that right now our entire world is grieving. There is so much violence, so much devastation, so much loss. And even though our podcast focuses primarily on the loss of our loved ones, there's certainly a lot of that. But grief can just be loss of anything, loss of lifestyle, loss of marriage, loss of relationship. So it seems to me that there's a lot to be said by at least listening to or opening your mind to some of the Buddhist philosophy. So thinking about that, how do you feel that the Buddhist philosophy can help someone who's grieving? Thank you for that question. The first thing that I would offer is that Buddhism offers a path of presence and turning towards rather than away from that which we perceive as uncomfortable, uh, difficult, for instance, unwanted emotions. And in that motion of turning towards and learning how to stay present with, how to be with, just like a friend or beloved or compassionate mentor would be with us at our side through anything we're experiencing as humans. We learn to access, and I would say unlock, a much deeper love within than many of us know we even have. And in the action of turning away, and I very much grew up in what I call the culture of sunshining, uh, Southern California. Let's keep it light. Let's push away difficult <laughs> emotions. Let's not have those uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> All that gets pushed away doesn't actually go anywhere, but right. deeper into the trauma imprints in our body, exactly. deeper yes. into the collective field of, of unhealed trauma. So I love the invitation through learning to be present, open, accepting in order to access our already existing compassion that we might not know we have. I love the invitation to heal collective unmetabolized trauma. That trauma, that grief has been passed down for so many generations. That grief, which impacts all of us, whether we're fully conscious of it or not, it's been passed down, it's in our DNA, along with a tremendous amount of love, but we can't discount the grief, the grief of historical legacy of racism, colonialism, patriarchy, misogyny, pillage of the earth. I could go on and on. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then also finding that it's a path of connection and love and joy to consciously grieve, that it actually connects us so much more deeply. I would suggest that when we're numbing out to grief, we're also numbing out to our joy, two sides of one coin. So to learn how to really feel and honor our emotions and our collective experience in a way that says, there's plenty of room for this. Yeah, this is welcome. I absolutely love this. I a funny story that I have to tell because that for some reason when I see a a Buddha, it just instantly it just makes me calm. And I don't know what it is. I've always been drawn to it. And my son and I, he's 18, and we were talking about like his next tattoo. And I was like, you know, I really want one too. And he's like, What are you gonna get? And just off the top of my head, I was like, I go, I don't know, maybe a Buddha. And he's like, Well, are you Buddhist? And I was like, no, but <laughs> but I was like, I don't know, I, I'm not, but I've always kind of been drawn to it because it just seems the whole, the meditation and the the calmness and it, the joy, I think of that too, because of the calmness. And I, I don't know what it is, I'm just drawn to it. But I, I love this concept that it's, you're basically, you got to face it head on, you got to face your grief head on and go through it and work through it. And I yes. just like that. And also that in doing so, you get to remember who you really are. You get right. to remember the, the well of power and both gentle and fierce compassion and empathy. That is who we really are. There's a great case of right. mistaken identity in our world, yeah. uh, completely polarized at war with one another about so many topics today. So as you pointed to this peace and this joy, yeah. and I'll also just share that 
Today, we also have the contemporary secular mindfulness movement. And what's beautiful about this is it's the movement of drawing upon both Buddhist teachings and so many other wisdom traditions that pointed to something similar and allowing people, again, in a more secular way, to bring this into their everyday lives. People who might consider themselves uh, Christian or Jewish or other religions to also commit more deeply to the benefits of a mindful life. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize that because it's accessible to everyone. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm going to pipe in as a mom for a moment, Stephanie, and say (laughs) that my thought on why seeing a Buddha makes you happy. Yeah. Offers you that calm is because that's something you desperately crave. Right. Your life is so stressful. You have no time right. for yourself that that's something you crave. Yeah. So that when you, when you see Buddha, that's your thought that I need this. I need this. Right. And I'm drawn to it. Triggers it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. End of mom moment. <laughs> so, so, Eden, where do we begin? Now, for me, years ago, I want to say maybe five years ago, I reached a point where I realized there was so much negativity in my life that it was causing me stress. It was causing me discomfort. I honestly think my health was suffering from it. And I said, almost like that that movie, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take any more. I decided to do what I could to get rid of negativity in my life. I actually disassociated myself with some people who were friends that were so negative that's all they brought to me was negativity it was difficult because at the time my husband was extremely negative so that was more of a challenge but I made a conscious effort in my life I said to myself I have to do this for me my impression is that in grief and after I lost my husband I reached a point pretty early on, maybe it's because I read so much or listen so much or have so many toddler questions, but I reached a point where I said, I am not going to wallow in grief. I have to redefine myself. It was a conscious decision on my part. Not everybody reaches that point so quickly. What suggestion, recommendations, advice you have for someone who may be stuck in that rut of despair. Thank you. That phrase rut of despair is very powerful. And when I consider that phrase, I think both of personal grief and people who find themselves in a rut of despair about their pain for our world, a sense of there's nothing I can do. I'm completely overwhelmed and therefore paralyzed. So Equally important to being willing to feel our grief, to come down from the realm of concepts and ideas into our body where we can consciously meet the energy and emotions of grief. And this is important to not avoid it, to turn towards it. Equally important is to let that be a path of letting it move through us and letting ourselves be informed by our grief, as I mentioned earlier, informed by impermanence, informed by the notion that even if we each live to be 100 years old, life is short. So there is not time to waste wallowing in despair. So from compassion, and for me, I I like the phrase fierce compassion, because so often, and in today's world, that's what it takes, not gentle compassion. There's a time and place for that, but fierce compassion, our tenacity, our courage, our willingness to say, I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to show up to my life differently, informed by this grief, informed by this despair. It is not helpful to wallow in it. You, you with me? I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. And if you know someone, if you happen to be friends, relatives, or just acquaintance of someone you see who is really, really suffering, do you have any suggestions for how we can gently use fierce compassion 
to maybe help them realize that they have within themselves the ability and the power and the need, how important it is for them to make that decision, to come to that realization Mm -hmm. that that power to reverse course, so to speak, is within them. This is an interesting question because we do each have our own, from my perspective, organic process of grief, and it does need to take the, the time it takes organically. But I think part of what people are up against is actually the context surrounding them. Often there's the grief. And then on top of that, there's a whole social context that says, you're supposed to stay positive and So what's wrong with you for being in grief? Or that says, I'm not even here to, no one is here to listen to your grief. I have so many examples of people experiencing great loss and then no one was willing to listen because people didn't want to get pulled down or were so uncomfortable with the realm of human emotion. So I think because of that external context, it makes it, it prolongs the amount of time people spend in grief sometimes because they have to battle all of the energy about it being wrong. I think one of the kindest things we can do is to both offer the space and help people connect to the space they need to consciously grieve, to be supported in really being with. Sometimes it's the tidal wave of feelings. Sometimes it's a slower process of being with the feelings of it, but in a conscious, compassionate, accepting way. And in my experience, that allows it to move through. So it's a fine line, isn't it? Because we don't want to say snap out of it, but we want to be really good listeners. And many people have not been trained in how to be really good listeners. I find it a, a natural capacity we all have, but it has to be uncovered. It's not often taught in school. I will say that there is a time if it's someone we're close to and who trusts us and who can really feel safe with us to ask a question. Questions are always compassionate way to help people see something for themselves. So instead, I'm going to tell you my opinion that you should snap out of it. What has been the impact on you of no longer even going out to engage in your life because the grief weighs so heavy? Tell me about that impact. And what's being missed and who in you is being left out of life now? That kind of question can help them see for themselves. Does that mirror your experience? It, it does. And I love that perspective. You know, sometimes we're all looking for that quick fix. And whether it's something we ourselves would like that magic bullet of medicine. But when we see a friend of ours or someone we care about suffering, we just want to fix it. Right. That, yeah. And instead of trying to fix it. I love the concept of just allowing some time to, for it to happen organically, because that would certainly be much more successful mm-hmm. and learn maybe to sit in that awkward silence and just be there for and with that person who feels so isolated. Yes, that awkward silence is a fabulously fertile place. I have a lot to say about that awkward silence. I wish we could learn to love it rather than resist it. We, mm-hmm. People get so, so resistant to being uncomfortable, to being a little uncomfortable, <laughs> so rigid about what comfort means. I will also offer in response to your question that collective grief circles are something that many, many spiritual traditions have across the globe that many indigenous traditions have had woven into their culture. We don't so much have this within the dominant paradigm or we're all from the U.S. We don't have conscious grief circles, healing circles for grief uh, woven into our culture. So even after this podcast today, as an example, I'm guiding a grief ritual called Truth Mandala, which comes from the work that reconnects of one of my teachers, Joanna Macy. And it's a beautiful ritual that people do together to honor our love and pain for our world, for what's happening in our world. And it is incredibly healing, the amount of joie de vie (laughs) that one feels after a truth-telling ritual that's held in compassion, where grief is completely welcome. 
that kind of thing, I would like to see a whole lot more of. Invitations to collectively metabolize our personal and collective grief. So interesting. You know, there are so many, I think, options out there that we don't even know about that it becomes a challenge just to learn what resources might be available. So with that in mind, if someone listening today, for example, has liked what we've been talking about and really feel that, okay, maybe I want to check this out a bit more. Maybe I want to learn more. Where do they go? How do you find someone, for example, who practices the Buddhist principles and can help them? There is a great quote that when the student is ready, the teacher arrives. And a lot of it is about getting in touch with one's own readiness or ripeness. And it's amazing because when I first came to the path, we didn't have things like the internet or Mm -hmm. websites. And I literally was given a book that had no name on it. My first Zen teacher had not even signed her book. She had left it as an anonymous gift to the universe and read it. And it quite changed my life. And then that turned me on to the next place I went was reading Suzuki Roshi, who brought Soto Zen to the US from Japan, an extraordinary teacher. And what's fun today is that there are so many different teachers, teachers with different gifts. So in my experience, synchronicity has a lot to do with the student finding their teacher. I'll share my website. It's my full name, DebraEdenTull.com. If you look up in the area where you live, Buddhist teachers, or you might look up mindfulness teachers. You can find perhaps a group to practice with locally. It's always lovely to practice with a group. Sangha or community is a big part of practice. But ever since the pandemic began, for instance, I've been guiding my groups primarily online with certain retreats now and then offered in person. And it's been incredibly nourishing. Because then we get to gather with people from all over the world and without the use of fossil fuels and supporting one another to wake up through everyday life. So there are so many resources out there today. It's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you for that. And sadly, I have to say, this happens every week. I should know it (laughs) by now. Our time is winding down. So before we sign off, I would like Eden to offer you a few moments without Stephanie and I, usually me, (laughs) leading you with questions to just speak directly to our listeners and tell them whatever you would like. Thank you for that generous invitation. And I've so enjoyed being here with you today. I want to first let people know that two rich resources I offer are my book on relational mindfulness which Kathy already mentioned, a handbook to deepening our connection with our self, each other, our planet, and my newest book, which will be out in September, but is available for pre-order, is called Luminous Darkness, an engaged Buddhist approach to embracing the unknown. And we very much go into meeting grief in this book and meeting the teacher of darkness that I think we've all been given collectively to spend more time with now as we face global uncertainty. I also want to offer a very, very simple encouragement to all of our listeners. If we can just pause for a moment, maybe close your eyes. And if you're driving, it's fine to do this with eyes open. And just take in, if you will, three of the deepest and slowest breaths you've taken today. Just feeling the air as it enters your body, fills your body, and leaves your body. Noticing the impact of just slowing down a bit and turning your attention within. 
I'd like to offer a very short acronym that people can practice at home in their everyday lives. And it's simply the word stop. The S symbolizing to stop or pause, given we are all so busy, so engaged in doing and productivity, and sometimes overly engaged in the busy mind. So to pause, the T for take a few conscious breaths, just like we did because the breath always lives in the present moment, even when you leave presence. The O for observe, so you can just take a moment to observe the inner landscape. How am I feeling right now? Can I bring awareness to my mind, body, awareness to the moment? And the P is for proceed. So this very simple, short practice is a way that we can begin to meditate throughout our everyday life. I hope that's helpful for people. Thank you all. I will find it extremely helpful. And I know Stephanie yeah. is shaking her head. <laughs> um, I envision her at work this coming week. Using stop. If I just yell out, stop, it's not mean, okay? (laughs) For me. Yeah. Well, listeners, you know, I hope you've enjoyed this last half hour. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. We are going to have Eden back when her book releases this fall. I have an advanced galley copy that I'm holding aside until I finish reading her relational mindfulness, but I can't wait. I can't wait. This has really opened a whole new area for me for awareness and education. And I'm really, really excited about exploring it. And in some ways, wish I had found it years ago, but maybe I wasn't ready then. Hmm. Maybe I'm ready now. And I love the concept of when I'm ready, the teacher will come. And here she is. Hmm. She came to us. We didn't find her. She came to us, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So until next week, everyone, please take care of yourselves. You know how important that is. Think about things. Be mindful. Be aware. Love yourself. Love others. And stay positive as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.